Provost, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Dr. Helga Robinson Hammerstein, who is a fellow emerita of this college and who was for many years Secretary General of the International Commission for the History of Universities. She would be delighted that we have organized this event. On the 9th of January, 1694, St. George Ash, then Provost of Trinity College Dublin, walked to the lectern of the college chapel to deliver a sermon. This was no ordinary sermon, but was specifically designed to mark the centenary of the opening of the college to students. Now, as you're aware, Queen Elizabeth I had granted the University of Dublin a charter in 1592, and we are rightly marking that occasion this evening. She had, however, neglected to provide adequate resources, and it was there for two years before the college was ready to admit students. It was the latter auspicious occasion that Provost Ash was determined to commemorate. The choice of commemorating 1694 rather than 1692 may well have owed much to political turbulence in Ireland in the early 1690s. 1692 marked the setting up of the Irish Parliament, and the College may well have considered it politic to, uh, to defer its own commemoration until the attention of the Lord's Justices could be firmly fixed on the growth of the, the university rather than on, on inquiries into abuses of power. Ash, in his dedicatory preface to the Lord's Justices, made it clear that he hoped his sermon might contribute to encourage the study and improvement of learning or raise up any new friends and benefactors to our college. He was well aware that the Lord's Justices were the font of all patronage and ad advancement. And since two of the Lord's Justices had been ad ad active advocates of the Dublin Philosophical Society, which was a sister society of the Royal Society, and a society of which Ash himself had been heavily involved with, it also seemed likely that Ash would be assured a sympathetic ear. Ash's appeal to the political powers was by no means unusual in the history of TCD in the 17th century, since throughout the century, College had viewed the Protestant authorities at Dublin as their chief allies. Taking as his text Matthew chapter 26, verse 13, which expands on the generosity of the woman of Bethany, Ash's focus was on the generosity of the foundress. Now, of course, praise of Elizabeth I in 1694 was meant to be read as an encouragement of further benefaction from William and Mary. Ash made it clear that benefaction was a two-way process. Gratitude for financial support should not only be expressed by members of college in words, but also in deeds. In his view, it was the duty of members of college to ensure that the aims of its founders and subsequent benefactors were not forgotten, but were implemented. For, for Ash, only the institution of the university could accomplish this. It alone could ensure the improvement of piety and religion, the advancement of learning, and to supply the growing necessities of church and state. This theme of the function of the University of Dublin was a recurrent one throughout the 17th century, and in many ways, Ash was reiterating earlier 17th century formulations. There was, for example, very little difference between Ash's phraseology, and that included in Provost, uh, Provost Beadle's statutes of 1628, where the function of the university was declared to be a sea plot of true sanctity, culture, civility, and good arts. However, Ash's commemorative sermon of 1694, like all commemorative events, not only reflected old themes in the discourse between university and society, but also tells us about contemporary late 17th century preoccupations and perceptions of the university. What was notable and new about Ash's sermon was his defense of the university, the role of the university as an institution in society. And evidently, by 1694, he felt the need to remind the powers that be of the crucial importance of the institution of the university and society as a whole. In his own words, he sought to remove a mischievous prejudice against academic studies, which comes recommended in a venerable, imposing, proverbial dress, as if ignorance were the true mother of devotion and learning of atheism. The idea that Trinity College of Dublin, and more generally learning, might be perceived as a potential harbour of atheism would have been incomprehensible to the moderate Puritans who set up the college in the 1590s and early 1600s. They would, however, have heartily agreed with Ash's decision to leave his own personal library to augment the college's resources. 
For when we look at the history of the Trinity in the 17th century, the most noteworthy feature of its history is the commitment of members of college to developing their library, which they regarded as the heart, soul, and mind of the new institution. One of the first students, James Usher, 1581 to 1656, who would later become Archbishop of Armagh and one of the foremost scholars of the age, wrote to the English historian William Camden in 1606 that the college had, and I quote, a distinguished library recently established. Now, Usher was in a position to know because he and his father-in-law, Luke Challoner, who Fiona has mentioned, um, had been the principal book buyers of the institution and had traveled to England on a number of occasions to buy books. The collection they developed, which to all intents and purposes was almost complete by the mid-1610s, demonstrates beyond all doubt the ambitious view they held of it. Usher and Challoner were thinking big. They were conscious that Trinity College Dublin was both a college and a university. Thus, though Usher and Challoner looked to Cambridge for inspiration on content, they looked to Oxford, and more precisely the new foundation of the Bodleian, for guidance on scope. College libraries of the period usually numbered no more than 500 books. Trinity, by the mid-1610s, was over 4,000 volumes, comparable only to the Bodleian in Oxford. What Usher and Challoner were creating was a library fit for a university. What is really striking is that the early members of the college did this at a time when they had no money. In 1592, the Lord Deputy and Captains of Her Majesty's Army had donated over £600 to the college. Now, due to the Nine Years' War, this payment had been deferred until the victory of the Battle of Kinsale in 1601, and it's from 1601 onwards that you find documentation for the book-buying expeditions. But it should be remembered that that money had not been specifically allocated to the library by the, the, Her Majesty's captains and Lord Deputy. It was the college members themselves who decided to give it as a, the whole sum towards the foundation of a library, at the same time as they were destitute, asking the Lord Deputy for small handouts of cash. They did this because they were very well aware that the reputation of a college university rested not only on the renown of its own professors, but also, and more importantly, on the intellectual resources of its library. It still does. The comprehensive nature of the collection was intimately connected to the use of the library as a research facility, but utility did not stop there. In order to be truly useful, the library had not only to be complete, it also had to be public. Bodley constantly drew attention to this function of the Bodleian, and the fellows of TCD were not far behind him. In both Provost Beadle's statutes of 1628 and the Laudian Code of 1637, it was clearly stated that, and I quote, none but the provost fellows or such as beam fellows and bachelors of divinity living in the college, although no fellows, shall have access to the inner library to make use of the books. As for any others who have a mind to make use of the conveniency and benefit of the library, they shall sit in the outer library and borrow such books from the librarian as they are desirous of reading on condition that they shall return them before they depart." Unquote. Now, since the books in the outer library were mainly humanities and therefore formed the backbone of the undergraduate and non-theological postgraduate curriculum, this stipulation demonstrates that the TCD was not following the model of the Oxbridge colleges in banning student access. And arguably, they couldn't, because students in Dublin didn't have the same opportunities for book buying as their English counterparts, and therefore the need to grant them access was all the greater. Yet again, it shows the members of college thinking beyond contemporary traditional norms for colleges and aiming instead to provide a learning resource for all members of the university. The emphasis on utility was deliberate. What is particularly striking is the common use, both in Oxford and Dublin, of the catchphrase, the advancement of learning, which is constantly applied to both the Bodleian and TCD. Sir Francis Bacon, whose 1605 book of the same title, who had popularized the concept, congratulated Thomas Bodley on his arc to save learning from the deluge. But both men and the members of TCD were well aware that the function of a library was not only to preserve knowledge, but also to advance it by being as up-to-date as possible. The holdings developed by Usher and Challoner demonstrate beyond all doubt that the members of Trinity College Dublin in the early 17th century aimed to provide what we today would call cutting-edge scholarship. Given that in the 17th century Trinity was a colonial college, ideologically committed to the propagation of civility and confessionalisation of the Irish, 
The library also served as a touchstone of identity for the early fellows who by and large came from Cambridge. But the library not only strengthened the sen sense of self of its own progenitors, it also, and just as importantly in 17th century Ireland, displayed their civility, the very civility they were hoping to propagate to the native Irish. This sense of the library, and more generally the university, as an agent of civility, is frequently demonstrated by the various petitions of members of the college made to the Dublin government in the 1630s and going into the 1640s. For them, civility and confessionalization went hand in hand, one dependent on the other. For college fellows such as Challen and Usher, the chief function of the library, and by extension the college, was not only to reflect their own concept of civility, but also to be a polemical instrument in the intellectual war against the papal antichrist. As Bouzet states, such university libraries were viewed as arsenals in the confessional wars of, the 17th, of 17th century Europe. Now, no one was more aware of this than James Usher. If anyone was an embodiment of the function of Trinity College Dublin in the 17th century, Usher was. Described by the renowned scholar John Selden as learned to a miracle due to his extraordinary scholarship, Usher justly remains one of TCD's most famous scholars. He interacted with Trinity College Dublin in a variety of ways. He was one of the first scholars who entered in 1594. He became a member of the teaching staff and professor of theological controversies. And once his ecclesiastical career became meteoric, i.e. after his elevation to the Bishopric of Meath in 1621 and to the Archbishopric of Armagh in 1625, he became one of the college's most influential patrons. As a scholar of international renown, his publications inevitably cast luster on his alma mater and helped connect Trinity College Dublin to the 17th century Republic of Letters. Finally, a few years after his death in 1656, his own large printed collection of over 10,000 volumes would eventually be, do be donated to TCD by King Charles II in 1661, thus doubling the college's holding of printed books and enriching it with almost 700 manuscripts. The lead motifs between, uh, behind Usher's work, the fight against the papal antichrist and his love of scholarship, were not separate in his mind, and his views were clearly formed during his sojourn in Trinity College Dublin as both a student and fellow. Many of his preoccupations are reflected by his colleagues, colleagues in TCD during his lifetime, and many sermons emanating from college echo his concerns. The traumatic events of the rebellion of 1641 and the chaotic civil war following it only served to con convince the members of college that their fight against Roman Catholicism was not only justified but necessary. They attributed their survival during the turbulent period of the 1640s and 1650s to God's providential care for his faithful. But the civil war had complicated matters. For during the 1640s and 50s, there had been not one but two rival state authorities to, con to contend with, and within the Church of Ireland, new internal challenges were coming to the fore. The comparative peace of the 1660s and 1670s was cast aside with the accession of the Catholic King James II uh, in 1685. The worst fears of members of college were realized when Catholic troops took over the college in 1689, but help came from an unexpected source. Two Catholic priests, Reverend Michael Moore, who was appointed head of the college, and Reverend Tague McCarthy, who was appointed keeper of the library, preserved the books from the violence of the soldiers. But though the books were saved, many fellows had fled to England, terrified of a repeat of 1641, and it took some time for the college to recover. The story of Trinity College Dublin in the 17th century then is one of both survival and ambition. Survival in a complex, hostile environment for hostility not only emanated from the Catholic Irish who preferred to be educated at Catholic colleges abroad rather than in Trinity, but also from the state authorities who worried that the dominant Puritanism of TCD in the first half of the 17th century had led to internal dissension rather than a focus on the, on the aims of the state. A state attempt to reset the governmental stu structure of the college in 1637 was too little too late, and in 1641, the college was faced with a far more serious existential threat. The subsequent travails of the fellows during the civil wars tested the institution to almost breaking point. Almost, but not quite. For if survival was the dominant leitmotif of 17th century Trinity, so too was ambition. 
an ambition in the words of Prophet Ash to ensure that true religion might be taught, virtue inculcated, learning improved, and a constant supply of youthful men, both in church and state, furnished out and prepared. Though they struggled at times to achieve these objectives, members of college agreed that, not only, that only by building up a university could they accomplish such lofty aims. They did this by concentrating on the development of their library, and it was a cause to which they remained committed throughout the 17th century. For, as Provost Ash reminded his auditors in 1694, in books we may freely talk with the most celebrated philosophers and compendiously reap the advantage of all their studies and improvements. There we shall find reason without passion, learning without affectation, and an eloquence without noise or clamor. Thus, by the assistance of books and learning, we may acquire an intellectual omnipresence in all ages and to all places. Tis thus we break into all the hidden recesses of truth. By prioritizing the creation of their library at the start of the 17th century, and by developing it throughout decades of crisis, members of TCD ensured that Trinity College Dublin would not only survive, but would indeed become the mother of a university. Thank you.